right, we want to welcome you to our church service today. I'm glad that we can fellowship after church. We'll have a coffee hour right after church. But want to call us to worship and welcome you. I also want to say from the outset, uh, Happy Father's Day to you. And if your child is still at home, extra blessings. <laughs> and uh, David has a word. Um, I'd like us to welcome uh, Paul Reese, who's going to be with us through the summer playing organ, and we are very lucky. So welcome, Paul. <laughs>
God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And bless you, Stephen, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. of your Holy Spirit that we may always think those things that are good and by your merciful guidance may accomplish the same through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the book of Exodus. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy grace, a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, 
we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. The word of the Lord. reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for the righteous person, Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, more, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life more than that we also rejoice in god through our lord jesus christ through whom we have now received reconciliation the word of the lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his twelve disciples 
and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver, nor copper for your belts. No bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, Find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. The Gospel of the Lord. Come as the wind and cleanse, come as the fire and burn, convert and consecrate our lives to our great good and your great glory. Amen. Amen. The sermon is based on today's reading, Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome. Rome! I was just in Rome, as a matter of fact. Judy and I and our older daughter, Kristen, and her husband, Matt, went to Rome for four days. And then after that, we went about 45 miles north of Rome to a small town called Civitavecchia. I'm so proud of my Italian. <laughs> and, and caught a... Uh, uh, a Mediterranean cruise to Barcelona, Spain, Marseille, France, Florence, and Naples. And uh, we had the, lift, the trip of a lifetime, unless I come into a large sum of money, in which case we will continue to have trips of a lifetime. <laughs> so, of the many things we did in Rome, there is one point of interest I uh, want us to think about a saying we all have heard, all roads lead to Rome. Now we were being led by a tour guide in the Roman Forum. The, ro the Roman Forum are the ruins, a rectangular forum or plaza, and they are the ruins uh, of of uh, 
government buildings right there in the city of Rome. And the tour guide led us to the, the exact spot, the specific point to which all roads in Rome led. And that spot is called the Golden Milestone, uh, erected by Caesar Augustus in the year 20 BC. So there I stood at the center of Rome, to which all 29 military highways led, 372 roads connecting the empire's 113 provinces covering over 250,000 miles led, of which 50,000 miles of the road were paved with stones. There I was, the center of Rome. Now I want you to tell, when, when I say paved with stones, you know, all of Rome is paved with stones. I mean, you can't walk well. At least I could. Because you're walking from one stone to another, and you don't want to walk on half a stone because you would slip, at least I would slip, and sprain my ankle or something. So walking in, in Rome is dangerous. And even more dangerous is being in a taxi. Because <laughs> th those people are crazy over there. They drive like they're crazy. You wouldn't believe the way Roman traffic is motorcycles weaving in and out, head right there on your uh, tail, uh, you know, one after the other. Judy said to me, uh, Joe, I understand you a lot better now having been at Rome. <laughs> you, because I'm half Italian. Anyway, this leads to the sermon today. The sermon today has to do with our reading from Romans, chapter 5, verse 1. And it begins with the word, therefore. And just as all roads lead to Rome, so every verse in the first four chapters of Romans leads to the word, therefore. And that's what I'll be talking about today. And whenever you see the word therefore, you've probably heard, uh, find out what the therefore is there for. <laughs> and it is therefore because it's uh, a, a uh, conclusion point of all Paul has talked about prior to that. And he has intensely uh, reasoned about the word righteousness. So the first verse of chapter 5 begins, Therefore, we have been justified by faith. So point one of the sermon is we are justified. Now the word justified is from the Greek word dikeosun, and that one Greek word has two translations, righteous and justified. So Paul's talking about the circumstances of the lives of Christians that they have been justified, they have been righteous. And I want to give you a simple definition of justified, and I never forgot it since I first heard it many decades ago, and I hope you won't forget it either. Justified means God looks at me just if I never sin. Say that about yourself. God looks at me just if I never sin. Can you imagine that? Uh, thinking about all of your sins, uh, reflecting on your sins. You know, if the Holy Spirit is present with us, one sign of that presence is that we are convicted of our sins. So if you are convicted of your sins, give thanks to God because that means the Holy Spirit is with you. If you're not convicted of your sins, uh, take care and I would suggest get on your knees. But justification means 
God looks at me just if I never sin. And righteous, the other translation, means that I have a right relationship with God. I am right in God's eyes. As we consider the Christian life, we can say the Christian life is a challenging life. It's much more than receiving salvation. It's about growth and transformation. Uh, what does this mean for you and me? It means that we are empowered to grow. Empowered not by our own strength of character or personal discipline, although these do come into play, but empowered by God. We have been given the shape of the character of God. Righteousness. Our starting point for growth assures our end point. We start as righteous and we end up as righteous. Uh, take a good swimmer, an accomplished swimmer, jumping into a body of water. The swimmer knows he can swim and he knows he will make it way far to the other end. Starts as righteous, ends as righteous. Uh, someone who does not know how to swim jumps into a body of water, is frantic, is fierce, fierce has a lot of fear. <laughs> Fearsome. And uh, doesn't know that he's going to make it very far at all. Uh, so he is not righteous as, a, as the uh, metaphor would go. One has to be a swimmer in order to swim. One has to be righteous at the beginning in order to continue to be righteous. Likewise, Paul says that we are justified. We are righteous. And Paul's not discounting that we have a long way to go to travel in becoming righteous. But we are those who know how to become righteous because we have been made fit for righteousness. Now, we are justified by faith, point two, and we have peace. See, the problem is sin. And when I say we have peace, I'm talking about the kind of peace that exists in a time of war. If there's war, there's no peace. If there's war, there's no reconciliation. But we are in a battle of sin. We are soldiers in the army of sin. We are against God, not doing God's purpose. We do not have peace. But if we come into God's fold, then we are justified and righteous. We no longer are fighting God. We are no longer contrary to God. And we are reconciled with Him. And being reconciled with Him, there is no more enmity. The conflict between human, humanity and God is over, and we are righteous and justified. And how do we have this peace? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, we have this peace because someone made it for us. We didn't do it ourselves. I didn't stop sinning by myself. It was grace. It was God that took the first step, as it says, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let me summarize by saying in that all roads lead to Rome, so everything Paul has written in the first four chapter of Romans leads to the first word of chapter five, therefore. And the verse is, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In today's epistle, Paul explains that the Christian enjoys two aspects in a relationship with God. First, being justified. God looks at me, justified, never sinned. And I am right and righteous in his sight. And secondly, the Christian is at peace. That is, 
no longer fighting in a war with sin, but now being in a state of reconciliation with God. Amen. Amen. and to confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, church and for the world saying hear our prayer for the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God Lord in your mercy hear our prayer. for Foley Beach our Archbishop Chip Edgar our Bishop and for Bill Skelton our Bishop in residence for all bishops priests and deacons especially for our rector, Father Marshall, our assistant to the rector, Father Joe, our assistant priest, Father David and Father Zach, our deacon emeritus, Peter Sean, and our church staff. We also pray for St. Andrew's Mission and their vicar, Father Jimmy Gallant, and for Jacob and April Rogers and their family as they prepare to move to Charleston. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, in particular Father Zach Nash, chaplain at Joint Base Charleston, All Saints Church in Florence and their rector, Father Jason Hamshaw, Chelsea, and their family, San Jose Church in the Dominican Republic, their rector, Father Isaac Pringle, Mejia, and their bishop, Moises Quesada, and Father Rob Sturry, Anglican chaplain at the Citadel. Lord, in your mercy, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, for our nation, for those in authority and for all in public service, especially our President Joe Biden, our Governor Henry McMaster, and our Mayor John Tecklenburg. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, particularly those on our parish prayer list, and for those we name at this time. Susan Compton, Don Tom, James Little, Julia Adams, Nancy Glenn, Ann Van Eglin, other others, and Rickard Deacon.
Lord, in your mercy, for all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection. Especially Naomi Radcliffe. In thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, bless every father and every grandfather with a passionate faith a persevering spirit, and a powerful testimony that overcomes any weakness and doubt as he serves as a spiritual leader and child of God. On this Father's Day, and for all the days of his life, fill him with your blessings so that one day he will stand before you and hear your ultimate words of praise. Well done, my son thou good and faithful servant. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who with God the Father and the Holy Spirit live and reign now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God.
Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. And uh, a special blessings for all of you. Uh, after church, we have coffee out. And it is furnished. So come and have fellowship at the coffee hour. We're trying to get back to pre-COVID days when we had good attendance to the muffin minute, which we had this morning, and to the lemonade, whatever they called themselves, <laughs> up, uh, after the family service and to uh, coffee hour. Saturday, June 24th, this coming Saturday is a very special day. Uh, we welcome uh, the new associate rector, Jacob Rogers, and his wife, April, and their two young daughters. So it will be a parish-wide event, Saturday, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., a fish crop. The church will fry the fish. You are asked to bring a side dish or a dessert. If that doesn't motivate you to come, drinks will be served. <laughs> back to school corner is up and running. Donate school supplies and backpacks or money. Uh, see your cast net, visit Gilchrist Hall, or put money in this backpack. And the backpack will be on that small little table next to the piano. As you may know, Father Marshall and a group of our church members are in Israel, walking on holy ground. Uh, so keep them in your prayers. Uh, Father Marshall will be back Friday. And uh, meanwhile, I'm in charge, but I'm not going to make any drastic decisions. <laughs> he would not like that when he got back. And I need not add live. He's probably watching the service as we speak. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.
Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. the whole 
Holy Spirit, all honor, and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now in the words our Lord taught us, we are bold to sing.
Love and serve the Lord. Thanks to God. Hallelujah. 